pleasant good evening to everyone. If you turn your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians. And I want us to notice the last verse of chapter 12. I think we know that the time here we're looking at is the idea of the miraculous gifts that were being sent forth to the laying on the apostles' hands of the church at Corinth. They were blessed with many of these miraculous gifts. But he says in verse 31 of chapter 12, But desire earnestly the greater gifts, and a more excellent way I show unto you. Desire the gifts, but a most excellent way show I unto you. At the end of chapter 13, he says, Now abideth faith and love and hope and love, and these three, and the greatest of these is love. Follow after love, chapter 14, verse 1. Yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. And he begins to talk about them. One place says that a most excellent way I show unto you. Love is greater than faith and hope. That sounds like most excellent, but it's a way. And what is it the way? Follow the path of love. So I think it is scriptural to think about love as having a way. And what helps us understand the parameters of that way are its various characteristics. So this evening, I invite your attention into the chapter 13. Right after 12 comes 13 and we get into 14. Here's what lies between to show us what the way looks like. Love suffereth long, in verse 4, and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not its own. Is not provoked. Taketh not account of evil. Rejoiceth not in unrighteousness but rejoiceth with the truth. It beareth all things, it believeth all things, it hopeth all things, it endures all things. Love never faileth. Love never faileth. This particular love is what Christians ought to have. They do, they're looking at it from the standpoint of righteousness. Rejoice with the truth. I don't have pleasure in righteousness. The men in the world, they, they think they love. But the character of the Christian is such, we look at what's right with God. And we rejoice with truth. And we don't glory in unrighteousness. So this is indeed the way that a Christian ought to walk. This way of love. When we look at this particular way, we need to understand where it's divided into two distinct areas. If we're looking at this road, this path, this path is winding. So is love. Because on one side of it is what love does. The other side of it is what love does not do. Just the opposite side of the street. It's what it is and what it does and what it doesn't do. And did you know that in total there are 16 of those characteristics, nine of them tells us what love doesn't do. That impresses me. Tell me what it is. I'll tell you what it's not. And of course, we have seven characteristics that tells us what love does. We're not going to take them in order, but I hope that we'll give a con- we have a concept of these things. That here's what a Christian is supposed to be like. It's what he avoids. This is what he rejoices in. And we begin to look at what is the, maybe the, a positive side of that. Let's take kindness. Love is kind. This form of the verb only occurs here in the New Testament, while the root word is found other places, like in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is kindness, as some translations give it. But when we think of that which is kind, we think of that which is a benefit to others. We want it to be pleasant for them, but really beneficial to them. And therefore, we approach them. This is something that we are involved in as we meet people for the first time. We should be kind. 
We should be that which well, I want to, to give you the benefit of the doubt. I, I want to be kind. I'm not going to be cantankerous with you. Be kind. And it is something indeed that has grace with that. But when we think about kindness and think of that, well, what is love? And we, I think we have a great definition of that. Love is seeking the well-being of another. Kindness is seeking the well-being of another. We want them to succeed. We do not want them to fail. We want to be there to encourage, not discourage. And there is indeed this kindness that we manifest. That's something that love is. It's kind. What it does, it shows kindness. But I think we need to understand, if we're going to benefit people, that this love has, or this, this aspect of love, has a context. It has things around it that if we just show up on an occasion and see what's happening, we won't think that's kindness. We won't think that. So let me give you an example of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, we read in verse 20, while well, he's dealing with the brethren in Corinth, and they wanted to reject his apostleship. They would say, oh, he's not coming. You know, he's, he's fickle, and all the things that he will talk about in the second epistle. But he says in verse 19, I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and I will know not the word of them that are puffed up, but with power. He's coming with power. And there are people that are puffed up. They think more of themselves than the, the teachings of the apostles. And so he leaves it up to them. He said, because the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. You talk a lot, but I'm coming. Now listen to how he's coming. What will ye? Shall I come with you with a rod or in love and the spirit of gentleness? You see the second part of that? He's not coming in love? It's not the kind of love that we usually think about. And when we see, you need to be kind. But did you know the context that's happening? He's being a benefit to them. But it may not be what you call kindness. And Paul says, oh, well, I come in love, meaning there's a distinction in this context of love and a rod. He said, yes, there is. And you use a rod. You come that way to these people. Paul, you're not kind. His adversaries could say that. But what are we saying? Love has a context. Now, what would we call Paul? That's tough love. That's tough love. I don't like that. Well, I'm sorry. I'm, a, I'm an inspired apostle. And I will come with the powers of an apostle. And it's up to you, brethren. Are you going to change? And I'm going to come there with a rod. And most people won't think that's love. But it is. Paul never walked outside of the way of love. But when we're thinking about that, we need to be thinking, well, it might appear not to be kind. Parents raising children. You may step in when they're doing some discipline. You don't think that's kindness. And it may be the very thing they need for their benefit, which is kindness. So it's not that he's not having love. It's the way we normally look at that. But there's the time for the rod. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, in verse 5, the apostle, the apostle or the writer of Hebrews, if it's not Apostle Paul, it's a writer. And he speaks about the chastisement of the Lord that's upon the people. There's chastisement, as if there's bringing a rod of discipline. And he quotes from the Proverbs, he says, My son, regard not lightly the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art reproved of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That's my son. I'm raising him. 
There's discipline that needs to be set forth. And sometimes there's a rod of discipline. And you may look at that, so that's not being kind. And yet it's being a benefit. Love is being set forth. Even though Paul says, you want to come a rotter in love and gentleness. Well, that, side, that kind of love and that side of that, you might, you might say, well, that's not love because I'm bringing a rod. But the point is, I love those who am I chasing. Now, you can be a sadistic dad. And get a lot of pleasure in beating somebody up. Well, I love you, son. But that's not Paul. That's not the Christian. It's that we're directing our attention for the benefit of another. Love is kind. But let's also understand it has a context. What love doesn't do? Love never fails. See, it's not, it never fails. Notice with me in... The reading, what's connected with love never fails. It's kind of building up to that point, And really it becomes a very positive thing. What does love do in verse 7? It beareth all things. It believeth all things. It hopeth all things. It endureth all things. Love never fails. That's the spirit that we read that with. It beareth all things. That means to cover. It's not... And sometimes this idea of enduring, idea of patience. But it's really, I want your well-being so badly. And I'm willing to overlook some things. I can't overlook sin. Unless I'm able to forgive it. Because you repent. But it's covering things. I don't want to make you look bad in that situation. So you bear it some things. You cover it. That's love. You're also not obeying, you're believing all things. You put the best intentions upon their actions instead of looking at what would be the worst intentions. That's what love does. And you believe that among your brethren. It believes all things. You're hoping for the best. When you hear something that's not good, you hope for the best because you love them. And you will endure all things. You'll never give up. I'll overlook this. It's a minor thing. It's not what we need. It was, I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to hope all things. I'm going to endure all things. You know what? Love never fails. It will be there for you. While that is a something that it doesn't do, it's very positive, isn't it? Love never fails. So this way, the highway turns this way and it turns that way. It's things that you do, it's the things that you don't do. But I also want to understand, it's the way of death. It's the way of death. And you will not manifest any, most of these characteristics of love if you don't understand that. When we think about becoming a Christian, I've been crucified with Christ. Is that not death? In order to love another, I am going to have to die to myself. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ. What does Christ do? Allow him to live in me. He's the one that's my Lord. He calls the shots. It's, how, it's his glory that I'm seeking. Not myself. Because I have to die to myself. And being a Christian, but you have to die to yourself to love. The way God says that way should be followed. Verse 24 of Galatians 5. And they that are of Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Now some of your translations will be different than this. But mine says with the passions and the lust thereof. When I read it in that way. Think about passions and lust. They're about the same. 
And he may be emphasizing the thing again, or he might be calling something that's opposites. See, the word passion is the word that is translated in Romans 8 and verse 18, sufferings. Some translations had it the affection of the flesh, and they realized it ought to be the affliction of the flesh. Who likes to feel pain? The flesh doesn't want to feel pain. We flinch when we hurt. And there is the flesh, you crucify the flesh, that's not willing to endure suffering. Dear Christian, that's your life of serving Christ. And I've got to put to death my propensity to want to get away from affliction. And that's, that hurts and that's painful. Because there's going to be a lot of things painful in serving the Lord. But we, we do that. I'll put to death the pathos and I'll put to death the covetousness of the flesh. I got both sides of flesh. One of them won't allow me to endure all things for the cause of the Lord. I may say I love you, but when it comes down to it, I can't stand the pain. I can't stand people ostracizing me. I can't stand what it means to suffer for the cause. Now, if you love, you'll put to death that part of the flesh that says, I'm not willing to suffer. And then the part that you really want part of the flesh. See, if you're going to love, you're going to have to die to yourself. Because if you don't, you won't suffer very long. You won't suffer long. You won't be patient because you have enough. And what goes along with that is not easily provoked. What sets you off? During the days of a week, well, we'll start on Monday, and you may be in, the, in some place, and you may not be provoked, but you probably will. Are you easily provoked? Do things just irritate you? Driving down Fairmont in the right lane, and I realize I'm trapped behind the long line at came. Irritating as it could be. I'm late getting home. And it's all out the driveway. It's all the way down Fairmont. And you wait and you wait and you wait. And you can't get home. You can't get out of that lane. That's irritating. Little things like that irritate you. I tried to get a key fixed this week. Took me four trips to the locksmith. Is that irritating to you? I was ready because I thought about this. No, it's not going to irritate me. I think it surprised the locksmith. You're back again? Yeah, it's not right yet. But look at your life. What, what irritates you? A lot of things. Because you know why? The flesh. We deserve to have an easy ride through life. We think we deserve it. And you may, you may, you may, you may deserve that, but that's not the way life works. You're not going to get everything that you want at the time you want it and the way it ought to be and the order it ought to be. And that becomes frustrating to people. But when you have died to that, you can suffer long. And things just won't irritate you as much. People won't irritate you as much. Because, see, love is the way of death. It's the way of death. And you will be easily provoked if you don't do that. I don't deserve to be in this long line behind Cain's. I've had Cain's last week. You know, I'm not going to be there this week. Our long lines anywhere are not getting what you want when you order it. Life is, can be irritating. Love is never that way. Because why? Why? We know it's the way of death. What about this combination? It does not vault itself. It's not puffed up. There's your pride. See, you've got to die 
to that selfish part of you that think you're special. We all think we're special. You are in a special way. We're individuals, different. But some people want to be praised. And they have ways of getting that praise. And sometimes it means to brag on themselves. See, I was patient at the locksmith. And I wanted you to know that today. So you realize, well, what a, what a patient guy he is. See, that could be feeding a spirit of pride. I didn't really brag on myself, did I? You don't know my heart. I could have. That's the way people work. Or let's look at self-pity. That's a way of vaulting yourself. Look what I have to endure. Look what my life looks like. And you talk about yourself in that way. And everything turns to about your life. What are you feeding? You're feeding that flesh that hasn't really died to self. And so we'll find ourselves bragging on ourselves. Are easily puffed up thinking I'm better than other people. And that's not love. Love doesn't do that. Because it's directed away from ourselves. We died to self. It's directed toward God. We love God. It's directed toward Jesus. We love Jesus. It's directed toward the people we claim to love. We'll look at what is great about them. And we'll talk about that. Because we died to the self. Now that doesn't mean we don't take pride in ourselves. But we don't vaunt ourselves. See, it's the way of death if we're going to love. Another one, it doesn't seek its own. And to think, well, love doesn't have any profit about it. I think Paul will say differently because in this same context of love, the Apostle Paul speaks about what will not bring profit to you. If I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and I have my body to be burned but have not love, it profited me nothing. I didn't think anything was to profit me because I don't seek my own. He's not saying that. It's that selfish part of us. That when there are four or five ways to do things, and your way is not chosen, you're seeking your own. Maybe it was the benefit of everybody. And being the benefit of everybody is that we're loving. You've got to die to yourself to love. And a lot of times people can't get over that. In Romans, the 14th chapter, we see... A problem connected with the eating of meats. Meats are clean, but are not clean to the, maybe the Jewish person that's become a Christian. They still have a conscience that said, I, I can't eat pork, whatever. And the apostle Paul speaks about love. Verse 15, because thou, of meat thy brother is grieved, thou walkest no longer in love. Walk what? Because I'm in a way. What is the way of love? I don't seek my own. Now, he's not saying you don't have your convictions. God wants us to have convictions. Paul knew that meats were clean. Some people knew that meats were clean. But here was one not used to that point yet. And so you don't seek your own, but you make sure you don't eat meats in front of him, encourages him to violate his conscience. Because if I do, I'm no longer walking in love if he violates his conscience because of me. I no longer walk in love. Destroy not with meat him for whom Christ died. wonder if was, he did this. He didn't, he said, I'm, I'm not going to eat meats. But he walks away 
with an attitude. When is that fella ever going to get on board with the teachings of Paul? Love is long-suffering. It's not about you. It's directed toward that person. That's what love is. And we've got to learn not to seek our own. Have our convictions. If established by the Bible, that's the way God wants it. God wants us to have convictions for what we believe. But those things that are not that clear, and there's judgments involved, Paul says, you let that weak brother, you don't violate his conscience, he'll come along. That's love. And when we don't do that, we're not manifesting love toward another. You see how many of these 16 are definitely related to the fact that we don't die to ourselves? There's that selfish part of us that rises up on certain occasions, having our own way, getting our praise the way we can get it. Easily provoked. Blame it upon others. The way of love is what it does, what it doesn't do. It's also the way of death, of really dying to ourselves so that we can be used for the benefit of, of God. And when we think of that, we realize that that becomes an important way to be living our lives. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. There also must be pure motives in love. This way of love has to be your motive is pure. Because look at the self-sacrifice of what we just read in chapter 13 and verse 5. The ultimate. If I bestow all my goods, I don't have anything left in my cupboard, in my pantry. If I bestow all my goods to feed, well, who needs to be fed? I'll just insert the word poor. That's what the translators did. Bestow all my goods to feed others, the poor. If I give my body to be burned, <laughs> There's a sudden, boy, you talk about a fellow that doesn't really care about himself too much. He'll take the pain of being burned to death. Man, that must be, that, that must be a loving guy. If I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profiteth me nothing. What do we learn there? Our motives must be pure. Why do we love others? So we get something back. That old selfish person's there. Or maybe you're kind of getting the point, I need to really show something. I'll just give my body to be burned. I'll be a martyr. What a, what a horrible thing if you're that person that Paul's talking about. I give my body to be burned and it profiteth me nothing. I thought they'd build a statue for me as a martyr for Christ. That's the ultimate. I give my life. I die. <laughs> I give my body. Self-sacrifice. Yeah. It's all there. But it's not here in the heart of why you did it. If I do that and have not love, it's really directed toward making me look good. I gave all of my goods. I fed the poor. What did you do with yours? Oh, a little short of giving all your goods to the poor, isn't it? You're making yourself look good. And the motives, those motives have to be, to be pure. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5, but the end of charge is love. The end of the charge is love out of a pure heart. And a good conscience. Why did I do that? And faith unfeigned. That's genuine. I hear a lot of people say, well, I want to manifest my authentic self. We're authentic. Want to be authentic Christians. 
Well, then have a faith that's unfeigned. Have a conscience that within yourself, you know your motives were pure. You love out of a pure heart, a good conscience that's not being violated and, not, and, is, and is still working and it's not seared. And you have a genuine faith. That's the end of the charge, Paul says. And that should be the charge that we manifest this week. I want to die to myself and I want to love others. What's interesting is that these characteristics of, of love, they're not in the context of husband-wife relationship. They're, even, they're not in the context of Loving a brother because of meats. He'll deal with that in this book of Corinthians. Chapter 8 and chapter 10. But this is how I'm going to take on these spiritual gifts. Which Paul has given. And they could, I could exalt myself in them. And that was some of the problem. They, they could speak in tongues. They think they're better than prophesiers. And the prophets... He said, a most excellent way I show unto you. And it was directed to them, the people that I minister to with these gifts. I truly want them to be edified. I truly want them to be helped. And that is the most excellent way that it goes. How do you answer the question, why is love greater than faith? How do you answer the question that love is greater than hope? Oh, when we get to heaven, we don't have to hope for it any longer. And my faith will be realized. So love is that which is greater because it'll still continue throughout eternity. That's what I've heard in my life. But I was thinking in the context that we see it in, and knowing that I died to self and I turned my life over, love is directing everything away from me and myself. And why could love be greater than faith? Because faith is directing my trust in God. I'm directing it toward God. It's me and God, my personal faith. Hope. It's my hope. I have a lively, living hope because I trust in Jesus. He was raised from the dead. It's my trust in Him and He is my hope. It's a personal hope. It's directed toward Jesus. But love. Includes somebody else other than Jesus and other than the Father. It includes every one of you. Because I direct my actions toward loving God, loving Jesus, but loving my brethren. Oh, hope, because we share in that hope, we'll love our brethren. But see, my direction just doesn't go to Jesus and doesn't go to God. What makes love great? I'm just offering you my opinion. But I'm based upon the definition that we always say. Love seeks the other's well-being. Whose well-being? God and Jesus. There's faith and hope. But what might make love greater than all three? That we can walk in the way of love. He didn't say walk in the way of faith and walk in the way of hope. The most, a most excellent way I show unto you. Because as we walk in our relationship with God, we look toward God beyond ourselves for salvation. We look beyond ourselves for our hope that allows us to live the godly life. And we're constantly looking beyond ourselves and our relationships. How is it affecting the other person? There's some things love doesn't do and there's some things that love does do. And when you realize that it's the 
death. Love is the way of death. Of dying to myself, it opens up the freedom to look to the well-being of others. Now, I picked this scene. This is a New England scene. And you see that the way of death, you see some trees that are putting on the leaves and winter is coming. I'm sure that row will look pretty good when you've got snow everywhere in New England. But I take all of that off and say, do you see the way of love? Oh, it's just not straight and it's not the way it's going to be. No, there's curvatures to it. To it. You, there's ways of that love does and there's things that love doesn't do. But when I look back and I look into the future, it looks pretty straight. The way. Knowing what love doesn't do and what love does do. I know there's 16 characteristics mentioned there. Some don't do and some you do. I look at the leaves and realize death. They're dying. Not the trees dying. The seasons are. And when I became a Christian, I'm dying to myself. I want to be a living sacrifice because I have a change of mind. And when I look at those leaves and realize they're full of moisture, that's why they're brilliant in their color. I'm full of the life of Jesus. But see, I'm not having to battle that much with bonding myself and being irritated all the time and all those things because I realize I've got to die to that. And then I can be a blessing to others. Yes, it's a way of death. Things you do, things you don't do. And yet, isn't that a pretty role? Isn't that a pretty scene? That's the way of love. And may we manifest that toward one another as we walk through life. And may there some things about love that you need to work on. <laughs> As well, all do. But I'll tell you, if you start tracing it back, why am I having a trouble with that? It may be because it's me. And Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, laid down, here's the way love works. And that will work in a marriage. It will also work in relationships between brethren. And I trust that we'll always have harmony and we'll always continue to love one another. If you're outside of Jesus Christ, we love your soul because God loved your soul. He gave His only begotten Son so that you don't have to perish, that you don't have to be hurt by the second death. They can give you a living hope through Jesus Christ and to follow the way of love as you see in the Bible. It's the best of the life they have now and that which is to come to train ourselves to be godly. And love is not a feeling. Love is the product of training. And may we train ourselves to walk in the way of love. Why don't you walk in the way of God's love unto salvation by coming to Christ this evening. If we can assist you in any way, please come as we stand and sing.